Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world. That simple statement from John in the first verse of chapter 13 colors everything that follows from that point on. From chapters 13 to 17, we are with Jesus in the upper room on the night before the cross. Everything that Jesus does and everything he says is designed specifically to prepare his disciples for his death, for his resurrection, and for his departure out of this world to return to the Father. He knew he had come from God, and he knew he was returning to God. When Judas left the room, in verse 30, Jesus began to teach his disciples everything he wanted them to know for the days ahead. Bible scholars call this portion of scripture his farewell discourse. It is one of the greatest concentrations of teaching from the lips of Jesus in the New Testament. In fact, looking at this scripture in a red letter edition, you will see that the last half of chapter 13 Almost all of 14 and 15 and 16 are the words of Jesus. And if you count his prayer in chapter 17, which of course is all his words in the upper room, this section, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all in red letters, is longer than the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So today we're going to look at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, not in one block, but interspersed throughout these chapters, Jesus talked about the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, whom he called, depending on your translation, the Comforter, the Counselor, the Helper, even the Spirit of Truth. Some of our best understanding of the Holy Spirit comes from the teaching of Jesus in this part of John's Gospel. Jesus wanted his men to know that he was going away. He also wanted them to know that he would be with them and never leave them. He would no longer be with them in the flesh, but he would be with them in the spirit, his spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, which now was with them and would be in them. And so he would be with them always. Jesus had this to say about the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is God. He is God as you and I experience him. He comes to us at the request of Jesus. And as a free gift from the Father. And he is the same kind of companion to us that Jesus was to his disciples. He is our advocate, our comforter, our counselor, our intercessor, and our friend. The Holy Spirit comes to stay with us forever for the purpose of guiding us into the truth. The world, those outside of Christ, are not able to perceive or comprehend or understand the work of the Holy Spirit 
but believers can both know him personally and experience him intimately. The Holy Spirit is the person and presence of God around us and within us. Now, everything that I just told you, that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, I found in only two verses of Scripture. Look with me at John 14 and verses 16 and 17. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. On the evening before the cross, he told them in verse 33 of chapter 13 that he was on his way out of the world. And that after a while, they would see him no longer. He told them in verse 2 of chapter 14 that he was going to prepare a place for them in his father's house. But they would not be left alone. They would have a companion with them and in them who would be everything to them that Jesus had been for his previous three years in the flesh. It's only two verses, but let's stand for the reading of God's word. And I'll read for you John 14, 16 and 17. It's on the screen, but I love the fact that you're looking at your Bibles. Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Your Bible might say comforter. Your Bible might say helper. My Bible says counselor. We'll talk about that. He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him. Some versions say receive him. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I'm going to take these two verses phrase by phrase, almost word by word, and share with you the riches here about the nature and the work of the Holy Spirit. But first, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you have revealed your true nature to us, that you are known to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we love you so much. We thank you for the work that your Son did here on earth to take our sin upon himself, offer himself up to you as an acceptable sacrifice in our place. That you might pour out on him the judgment that we deserve so that you could set aside our sentence and reconcile us to you, a holy God. But we recognize today that we would really understand none of this and the depth of it and the riches of it if it wasn't for your Holy Spirit making it real to our hearts. We thank you that he came to lead us into the truth, to glorify Jesus, and that we might experience you in a real and personal way. We thank you that even as we read your word and hear your word proclaimed today, your Holy Spirit is with us here today to interpret it and make it come alive in our hearts. We ask you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. All right, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The first thing I see in this passage 
this thing that Jesus said to his disciples is that the Holy Spirit comes into the lives of disciples at the request of Jesus himself and he comes to us as a free gift from the Father. Jesus said, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. What a tremendous concept this is. The Holy Spirit of God, God himself, as we experience him, comes to be with us because Jesus asks the Father on our behalf and the Father sends him. Now, those who have trouble with the biblical doctrine of Trinity need to look at passages like this. Here's Jesus the Son saying, I will ask the Father. The Father will send the Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all there in the same sentence. Right? Acting in perfect unity and harmony. The Son asks the Father. The Father sends the Spirit. But note again, it is Jesus who asked the Father to send the Spirit. The Father sends forth the Spirit into someone's life only at the request of the Son. Now, later in verse 26, Jesus said that the Father would send the Spirit in my name. And again, there's no contradiction here at all. They are all acting in complete harmony. Jesus would say in verse 7 of chapter 16, I will send him to you. This means that in order to truly experience God intimately and personally, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, first, we must come to Jesus Christ. There are all kinds of believers in the world today. There are those who believe in a higher power. There are those who believe in a first cause, some who believe in uh, an ultimate reality. There are nominal Christians, people who claim to believe in the God of the Bible, claim to believe in his son Jesus, but they don't really know him personally. They're just raised in a church culture. And then, of course, there are people who don't claim to believe in Jesus, but they believe in the God of the Bible. All kinds of believers. But if the Holy Spirit only comes into our lives at the request of Jesus, then only those who believe in Jesus and become his disciples and surrender to his lordship can receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. Others may experience the work of the Spirit around them as God seeks to draw them and not understand it is the Holy Spirit, but only those who are born again through faith in Jesus Christ experience the indwelling Holy Spirit because he comes to us only at the invitation of Jesus himself. But, the moment we do come in faith and surrender to the Lord Jesus, Jesus petitions the Father. The Father willingly gives the Spirit to us as a free gift of his grace. Jesus said, I will pray and the Father will give the Holy Spirit, and the, the word that Jesus uses there is a word that means to give as a conscious act of the will, to give freely and to give 
willingly. It is the word that means to give as a gift. The presence of the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and it is never something that we have to earn. His presence in our lives is never anything that we deserve, but he is graciously and willingly given by the Father as a free gift. Amen? Amen. In his sermon on Pentecost morning, Peter boldly shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. He told the crowd at Pentecost, this one Jesus of Nazareth, whom you know, whom you participated in his death. He was our long-awaited Messiah. You killed him, but we're all witnesses to his resurrection. And they were cut through to the heart. And said, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Friends, that's what salvation is. Salvation is receiving the free gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be born again, to be born of the Spirit. You come to Jesus in faith, you surrender to him, you repent of your sins, you bow to his lordship, and he, the Father sends the Holy Spirit into your life, and that's your spiritual rebirth. Paul said in Romans 8, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, then he doesn't belong to him. Salvation begins when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God come in the flesh who died for our sins and was raised from the dead and with a conscious act of the will we believe and surrender to his Lordship then he petitions the Father, the Father sends the Spirit, and he is imparted as a free gift into our lives. Amen. You with me? All right. So let's talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The second thing I see here in this passage is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that is that he is to be the same kind of, of companion to us that Jesus was to his disciples when he was here in the flesh. He is our advocate, our comforter, our counselor, our intercessor, and our friend. Now, Jesus described the Holy Spirit as another counselor. The word another is an interesting word because it is a word that means another of the same kind. The Greek language is a wonderfully colorful and very precise language. In English, we only have one word for another. But the Greek language has two. They have two different ways of saying another. And one of their words, the word alos, the word used here means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. And so when Jesus said, I will send you another counselor, he's saying, I am going to send you a counselor who is as the same kind that I am. I'm going to send you a comforter, a counselor, an advocate, a friend who will be to you just like 
me. Now, when Paul wrote to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, he said, I am amazed that you have listened to another gospel. He used that other word, that word heteros, which means another of a different kind. You've listened to another gospel, and that's why some translates it, some translate it as you have listened to a different gospel. But the Holy Spirit is the same kind of companion with the same nature and the same ministry towards us as Jesus was for his disciples for the three years here on earth. And the word comforter in the King James, the word counselor in the NIV, the word helper in the Good News Bible and in my New American Standard are all different attempts to translate the same word. And it's a great word. It's an amazing word. It's the word parakletes. And it means to call someone to stand beside you. I'm just going to let that sit with you for a second. Paracletes, what Jesus called the Spirit, is someone whom you call to stand beside you. Now, what are the reasons why you might call someone to take their stand beside you? Well, I need someone to help me. I need someone to comfort me. I need someone to encourage me. I need someone to exhort me. Perhaps you need someone to stand beside you to defend you or to protect you or to argue your case on your behalf. This word is actually the technical term for your defense attorney. Someone who calls to stand beside you and argue, listen, your case against the accuser. The accuser is the one who argues a case to condemn you. So you need a defender to come stand beside you and argue your case on your behalf. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you need a guide. Maybe you just need a companion and a friend, someone to talk to and someone to share your life with. This word has all those meanings. And so this description of the Holy Spirit means he can and he does and he will do all these things for you. Now, Jesus did all this for his disciples, and the Holy Spirit now performs the same ministry for us. He's our comforter. He's our counselor. He's our helper. He's our advocate. He's our guide. He's our intercessor. He's our companion. He's our friend. So when Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was another companion, another counselor, another helper, he was saying, the Spirit whom I send will be to you a friend just like me. Have you ever considered why Jesus said it is for your good that I'm going away. Some versions say, it is to your advantage that I go away. For unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. John 15, 7. 
You see, as long as Jesus was here in the flesh, he was confined to being in one place at one time. The only people who could enjoy Jesus' companionship or his ministry were those who were with him wherever he was. But the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. So now every Christian can experience the personal ministry of Jesus at all times and in every place, no matter where we are. Amen. Paul said, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now the Lord is the Spirit. So now every Christian can know the Lord Jesus as their personal comforter, counselor, encourager, advocate, guide, friend, companion. The Lord lives in them. I'm going to say the Lord lives in us through the person of the Holy Spirit and we can personally receive his ministry. Third, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit comes to stay with us forever for the purpose of guiding us into the truth. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you. How long? Forever. Even the spirit of truth. His purpose for coming to us is to witness to the truth and to guide us into the truth. Throughout the rest of Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit, he made this abundantly clear. Listen to what Jesus said about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. From John 14, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. How did the gospel writers remember everywhere that they went and everything that happened and everything that Jesus said in order to write their gospels? You think the Holy Spirit was reminding them of everything that Jesus said and did? From John 15, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from my Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Conviction regarding sin is the work of the Holy Spirit. But when he, the spirit of truth, this is John 16, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that is why I said the Spirit will take what is mine and make it known to you. Another perfectly good Trinitarian passage. The Father has revealed everything to me, and everything that is mine 
I tell the Spirit, and the Spirit reveals it to you. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate asked that universal question, what is truth? And the Bible is very clear about its answer. There is only one truth, and his name is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the truth. There is one standard for knowing and determining the truth, and that standard is this. Does it bear witness to Jesus Christ? The ministry of the Holy Spirit around you and within you is to lead you to Christ, to witness to Christ, to glorify Christ, to bring to your remembrance the words of Christ. He is the Spirit of truth because he witnesses to the truth, and the truth is Jesus Christ. Now, next, Jesus explained why the world has so much trouble understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. He said that the world, those outside of Christ, are not able to perceive or comprehend the work of the Holy Spirit. If you have trouble understanding spiritual things, if the Bible is not an open book to you, if people explain to you the things of Christ or the things of the Spirit and it goes right over your head, that's a really good sign you're not born again. I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. The world cannot accept him, and again, some versions say receive him, perfectly good translation. The world cannot receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Many times in the scripture, when Jesus re refers to the world, He's not talking about the planet on which we live. He's talking about people who don't have faith. Those who are alienated from God, those who are cut off from God, those who are opposed to God, those who hate God. That's the world. They cannot see the Holy Spirit, which means they cannot perceive, and they cannot know him, which means they cannot comprehend or understand. The word perceive here, the word to see means to observe, to perceive, to understand, to experience. The word know here means to know, to understand, to comprehend, and it means to know intimately and by personal experience. Jesus said that those who are of the world cannot ever truly understand, perceive, or experience the Holy Spirit of God. Have you ever wondered why your non-Christian family members just don't get why the things of God are so important to you. They don't get it. I don't understand why you like these things, why these things are important to you. Why? Because they're not important to them. Because they don't get it. It's not their fault, but they'll never understand why the things of God mean so much to you. Have you ever had an experience and you clearly see the hand of God in that experience and other people see the exact same thing, they don't see God at all, right? And why is 
it that you go to the scripture and the words just leap off the page and truth is revealed to your heart and you are touched and you are changed by the word of God and other people read the same passage and it just doesn't make sense to them or they come up with the more hair brain interpretation. And how is it that the word of God, which was once a locked mystery to you, became such an open book of revelation once you came to the Lord Jesus and received the Holy Spirit? Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 3, describing his own people, the Jews. He said, their minds are made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And he said this about the wisdom of God compared to the wisdom of the Gentile world. This is 1 Corinthians 2. God has revealed to us a secret and hidden wisdom through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have received the Spirit that we might understand all that God has given us. The unspiritual or natural man, the unsaved man, does not receive or understand the gifts of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him and he's not able to understand because these are only understood spiritually you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to understand spiritual truth and if you can't understand spiritual truth I'm just saying this in general if you don't understand the things of the Spirit, check yourself. See if you are truly born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Without the presence of the Spirit, it is literally impossible for anyone to understand the things of the Spirit because it is the Spirit himself that enables us to understand. Jesus said the world can't receive him because they can't see him and they don't know him. Because the Spirit only comes into our lives as a gift from the Father at the request of Jesus. And so we can't receive the Holy Spirit unless we come in faith to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I will say that as people pray for the lost, this is what happened to me. My grandfather, grandmother prayed for my salvation for years. And then as I began to get close, friends of mine began to pray for my salvation. When we pray for someone's salvation, the Holy Spirit begins to work around them. Theologians call this prevenient grace, the grace that comes before. And the Holy Spirit begins to reveal truth and begins to draw them and begins to pull them in. And the whole point is to get them to that place 
where they will see Jesus and receive him and surrender to him. And then at that point, the Holy Spirit invades their life and all things become new. And that's why we pray for the lost. So that that Holy Spirit who is with them will eventually be in them. Does that make sense? All right. Finally, Jesus said that believers can both know the Spirit personally and experience Him intimately. The Holy Spirit is the person and presence of God around us and within us. You know Him, Jesus said, for He dwells with you and He will be in you. Jesus was saying to His disciples on this evening before the cross, you know the Spirit's presence now because He's been with you. He's been around you. As you have been with me, the Spirit who is in me has been working in you, working around you. But very soon, you will experience his very presence within you. And you will know the Holy Spirit intimately by your own personal experience. And John tells us the exact moment when that happened. When the disciples experienced the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is in John chapter 20, and it is in verse 21. It is the evening of resurrection day. The disciples are gathered in that borrowed upper room. Judas is dead. Thomas is missing. This is what happens when you don't attend church. <laughs> you miss when Jesus shows up. But anyway, Judas is gone, Thomas is missing, the others are in the upper room, the doors are locked for fear of the Jews, and Jesus stands in their presence. And he says to them, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You ask me, so when exactly were the disciples saved? Well, they couldn't be saved until after a Savior died for them and was raised from the dead. And so on the evening of Resurrection Day, as far as we know, the first saved people in the church were 10 of the 12 disciples when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, these surrendered, believing disciples were born of the Spirit of God. They received into their lives the indwelling Holy Spirit, and that's exactly what happened to you when you came to faith and you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you submitted to him, he prayed the Father, the Father sent the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit invaded your life. And that's what makes you fit for heaven. He took away your sin, and he gave to you his righteousness. And Jesus said that he came to dwell in your heart as your comforter, your counselor, your defense attorney, your friend. He witnesses the truth of Jesus to you. He glorifies Jesus in your life. He is yours forever that you may know God personally and intimately. 
He remains with you and dwells within you. This is the teaching of Jesus about the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, for what he accomplished on our behalf. And thank you that he gives us the Holy Spirit from the Father when we surrender in faith to him. Jesus taught on another occasion. If you men who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children when they ask, how much more will your heavenly Father keep on giving the Holy Spirit to those who keep on asking? Thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit comes to be with us and does the ministry of Jesus within us. And I want to pray today, if there's anyone here today who's never experienced the personal presence of God in their lives because they've never really surrendered to the Lord Jesus, that they might be born again today. Regardless of their status and their relationship to the church, and if they know they don't know Jesus, that they'll come to know him today. Father, I pray that we will, as individuals, as families, as a congregation, continue to seek the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen.